Hi, Eli. Hi, Bob. How are you doing? I'm doing all right. I'm doing all right. How are you doing? I am not complaining on camera. That's as good as uh, I get. Let me introduce this. That's as good as I get. Uh, let me introduce this. I'm Robert Wright. This is The Right Show, which you can uh, watch on uh, Blogging Hits TV website or YouTube, or you can listen to as a podcast. And you can click like buttons, rate and review, and so on. But you are Eli Clifton of the Quincy Institute for Responsible Statecraft, a foreign policy think tank. And uh, we are going to talk about I guess, how money influences foreign policy discourse and hence foreign policy. Uh, some would say that's a polite way of putting it. They would say we're going to talk about how money corrupts foreign policy discourse. But I'll, I'll leave that judgment uh, to the audience. Um, why don't you, and by the way, we'll be talking about a, a number of think tanks, and, and we'll talk more about yours because they're all, they're all part of the picture. They all get funded somehow. Um, and. Uh, and we may be talking about uh, other institutions, may, maybe including journalistic ones. Um, so what is your title these days at Quincy? Well, I'm a senior advisor to the Quincy Institute, and I'm an investigative journalist at large for uh, Responsible Statecraft, which is our publication. And mm -hmm. you can read Responsible, Responsible Statecraft at responsiblestatecraft.org. Uh, and you can visit the Quincy Institute at Quincy Inst. That's Quincy, Q-U-I. N-C-Y-I-N-S-T dot org. Right. They should not use any of the other spellings of Quincy. No. This is the one. This is the one. John John Q. Yes. Who 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 said, uh, what did he say? D don't go forth seeking monsters to destroy or no something. Yes, uh, with reference to American destroy. foreign policy. That's right. That's right. right. And that, that's sort of the the the, the inspiration, obviously, for what we do. It's also the inspiration for the John Quincy Adams Society, which we are good friends with, but it is a separate entity that right. does other stuff. Uh, really good work, especially on college campuses, trying to engage mm -hmm. uh, young folks on foreign policy and exactly with the same principles and with the same ideas in mind that, that we have around, let's try to avoid, uh, you know, well, John Quincy Adams put it so much more eloquently, but let's stop making so many stupid mistakes. Mm-hmm. As Obama said, although he didn't always take his advice, uh, what did he say? He, he could sum up a good foreign policy as uh, don't do stupid shit or something. Don't do stupid shit. Yeah. I mean, mm. uh, ideally, you're, you're, you're aiming a little higher than that. Uh, ideally, you're yeah. trying to further some notion of uh, your, your interests. Uh, that would be ideal in any form of public policy, not just foreign policy. Uh, but I think yeah. in foreign policy, maybe we've gotten a little more disconnected from some notion of, hey, let's talk about what our goals are and whether or not we're achieving them in any any definable sense. Mm -hmm. OK, so you your your specialty as a journalist is kind of following the money, uh, you know, finding out, uh, pouring over. IRS, you know, documents and stuff and, and public disclosure forms and so on and figuring out who's funding various, uh, I, I guess, think tanks in, in particular. You've spent a lot of time on that. I want to I want to talk about specific think tanks, but I guess we might as well start out with Quincy. A lot of people probably know the story. Um, now, Quincy is, uh, you know, part of uh, the term being used is restrainers to refer to people who uh, think our, our foreign policy should be much less militaristic, that, that we should uh, exercise a lot more restraint than, we, when, than we've been exercising. It sounds like a broad term. One reason it's broad is because it's meant to encompass people on both the left and the right who have at least that much in common, right? That, that they want a, a much less aggressive uh, foreign policy. and this this left right thing kind of is is mirrored in the funding of Quincy itself. We might as well start there because this got a lot of attention when Quincy was founded. What a couple of years ago? Well, I, I I don't know how long it's been now, but there was a lot of attention paid to the very unusual combination of primary funders. Right? You want to yeah. talk about that? Yeah, I mean, so and to be clear, I, I think our primary funders deserve uh, deserve a lot of credit, and it does. It's not just limited to the two that that got all the attention, but 
Uh, I, I understand, and I say this as a journalist, so I'm probably more understanding of why this was a big deal than for some folks who said, well, why is everybody talking about these people being funded by by the Charles Koch Institute and by uh, by George Soros' Open Society? Uh, and I, I get that. that. That's a really appealing story. And, and I think to a degree, we really did embrace it because we understood that was going to be uh, that was going to be the story either way. And, and it is interesting. Uh, to be clear, it's actually not the first time that Soros and Koch have collaborated before. They've done some stuff on criminal justice reform in the past. Uh, but I think that in terms of coming out into foreign policy, also the fact that we were launching a think tank that was, you know, in very many ways sort of in opposition to the so-called blob. And, you know, I think you have some strong thoughts on that. We can discuss that a, a bit more, what that yeah, blob maybe is. We should, maybe we should stop and, yeah, mention that. Uh, and, and you're right, if people want to uh, to read what I consider uh, the definitive treatise on the subject. I'm half kidding. Uh, I wrote a long thing on, in my uh, non-zero newsletter uh, toward a unified theory of Blobdom, but but the term, uh, we can say, loosely speaking, it refers to the foreign policy establishment or, you know, and in particular, those people within the establishment who have tended to prevail in in foreign policy discourse uh, for lo these many years, and it includes everything from neo neoconservatives to so-called liberal internationalists. I say so-called because some of us would like them to uh, practice what they preach in the way of following international rules a little more. At least some of them. Um, so so anyway, yeah, the blob Quincy, I would say, is the one major foreign policy think tank that is decidedly and intentionally not part of the blob in terms of uh, the the p- kinds of policies that tend to be espoused. Is that all fair? Yeah, I, I think that's accurate. I think there's some others where there's folks at them who are probably not, wouldn't identify sure. as being part of the blob. And I think that Cato, in fairness, uh, which is, again, not a dedicated foreign policy think tank, right. uh, probably right. also would fall into that category. I, I think the thing that does distinguish Quincy quite a bit, and, and there are others, there's the Center for International Policy, there's the Institute for Policy Studies, um, that, that probably also would identify in that manner. But I, I think, Quincy, one of the things that we uh, uh, identified early on is that we're going to be a foreign policy think tank. And, and I say that because I think that's significant, because uh, I look at a lot of other think tanks out there, and uh, I don't think it's a sinister thing. I don't think it's nefarious. I just think it's the reality, which is that if you are doing a variety of issues, uh, foreign policy will generally always be uh pushed down in terms of the priority in which it takes within the institution. Uh, and there's a number of reasons mm-hmm. for that, but I think the simplest is, again, the, the most uh, uh, innocent explanation, which is that you know generally when you look at what the constituency of, of a think tank, for lack of a better term, is, or the constituency of the politicians that you're trying to influence as a think tank or inform are, um, that various other domestic issues will, will take precedence over foreign policy. So mm-hmm. it'll always get pushed down. It'll be seen as more of a liability sometimes. Than, than an asset. Right. Uh, and that's why I think you look at uh, think tanks that do a lot of different work, uh, including some I've done at, like Center for American Progress. Um, and you know, it's just it's just never gonna rise to the same level that other issues will. And as a result, the resources and the political capital aren't gonna be really put towards, towards solving issues of foreign right. policy, let alone challenging something like the blob. Right, and, and foreign policy can be divisive at these think tanks. It's like if Center for American Progress is trying to appeal to Democrats, liberals broadly, they may not welcome a lot of discussion of Israel. In particular, there was a famous incident at at, at CAP that, of course, you're aware of some years ago, uh, where they got some blowback from uh, things that were being published on their kind of blog, Think Progress, uh, and. Uh, uh, they got blowback kind of from the right, I would say, and uh, and they kind of and they kind of squelched. <laughs> yeah, and, the, you know, in, in, in full disclosure, of it. in full disclosure, I was there. I was one of the people being being attacked. Yeah. Uh, and and again, giving the most uh, you know innocent explanation of it that I could think of. Uh, the, the thing that I that I kept reflecting on when going through that experience is that you know what, if someone on the right was attacking somebody at, at, at a progressive in, so-called progressive institution, such as, let's say, the Center for American Progress on something involving, I don't know, financial regulatory reform or, uh, mm-hmm. or tax, tax reform or a social issue like same-sex marriage or abortion, um, they probably would have just said, well, that's just the price of doing business is that we get attacked from the right on these things. That's, it is what it is. That's, it, that's politics for you. 
But I think foreign policy gets treated in a slightly different way. And part of it is that they don't, people don't want to expend the, the capital to actually take a, a divisive or an oppositional uh, position on it. But I think that's a bigger problem here and one I really do want to get into a bit, especially with you, uh, which is that we treat foreign policy as being this space where pure ideas get to compete, uh, where it's a liberal space um, and that the, the driving uh, factors at play are different worldviews, visions, and strategies for furthering U.S. interests in the world, especially in the Washington, D.C. context. Um, and while I don't think that's totally untrue, I think it also is leaving out some huge pieces. And I think leaving out these other pieces is one of the reasons that we have the so-called blob. It's one of the reasons we have such little accountability in foreign policy. Um, and it's frankly one of the reasons that we've had a number of severe mistakes in U.S. foreign policy, especially since the end of the Cold War, where we've been, you know, we're still trying to extract ourselves from, from two decades of endless wars with, with, again, very little reflection on why that is. Uh, and I think part of it mm -hmm. is that we treat foreign policy as being, uh, you know, politics ends at the water's edge uh, and that there aren't different interests. People don't have different outcomes that they want to see. People right. don't have different goals that they're trying to achieve through the policies that they promote, but that we exist in this pure space where everybody's trying to pursue the same thing. And we're just, we're just splitting hairs about the methods of getting there. And mm -hmm. yeah. to take a step back, let's say yeah. you tried to apply that argument to the issues I just mentioned, abortion, taxes, financial regulatory, the environment. That's the one thing gun that control, every participant- Gun control. Exactly. That's the one thing that everybody in that debate, if you walked into the room and tried to make that argument, they would laugh in your face. <laughs> Because they'd say, right. of course we don't want the same are, outcome. The, yeah, right. They would say there are interest groups. The the NRA is obviously a, a you know, they're lobbying. Sure. They have policies. They represent people who own guns. Want, you know, we can talk about it uh, freely. The the irony is that um, you're right, that, that you're often discouraged from talking about how interest groups influence foreign policy. And yet, if anything... I would say their interest, their, their influence is greater than on the domestic front because Americans, by and large, don't care all that much about foreign policy. There's not a lot of grassroots sentiment out there shaping things that are happening on Capitol Hill, unless a lot of American soldiers start dying or something, or unless 9-11 happens. But, but by and large, they understandably care more about uh, Medicare cuts and and any number of other domestic issues than they do about these, these issues that seem far from their shores. So interest groups have, I think, a lot of, of influence on foreign policy more than on domestic policy, and yet we talk about them less. And, and you are, and, and you look into the, uh, you explore this, you want to talk about them more, first of all, and you and you and you personally do it by uh, looking at the flow of money. So let's talk about the way you know uh, money and think tanks. I mean, there's so many places we could start. Uh, the uh, uh, pick a think tank. What, what name a think tank you you you've looked into? <laughs> Um, well, and and would like to uh, I I know several I want to bring yeah. up before this conversation is over, but uh, pick a think tank, any think tank. Well, let's start with Quincy, uh, since I'm you know I, I I get accused, and I think there's some accuracy to it of being very critical, uh, and it's something I've tried to do more recently is to talk about well what could we do that's act what would be actually best practices for think tanks. Um, mm -hmm. And and I think that a lot of these will come across as common sense, and then we can get into think tanks that have not followed this and why that might be. Um, but, you know, when we were setting up Quincy, one of the things we talked about is, hey, we want to do this right when it comes to uh, how we talk about our donors, when we talk about uh, how we avoid conflicts of interest, uh, and how we deal with uh, you know, potentially complying with some laws that are not always complied with, I believe, uh, within the, the belt. What's an example of a law policy. that, what's an, ex what's an example of a law that's not always complied with? The Foreign Agent Registration Act. Farah. So, so what, and, and, and that says that if you're receiving money from a foreign country or a, a, a foreign interest, you have to disclose it in certain contexts. And if you're, you're saying receiving something funding from be, a, a foreign principal and you are acting as their agent, you're taking some form of direction from them. 
that you are to disclose it. It doesn't mean you can't take that money. Now, that's something that we decided that, hey, as a rule, we actually don't want to put ourselves in that situation where we need to make that judgment. And so our solution to it is saying we are not going to take any foreign government or foreign government linked funding. That's just something from the okay, beginning. So what, are some, what are some institutions that are taking it? It's a far shorter list to tell you the institutions that are not. <laughs> uh, start I mean, start I, at I, one end yeah, of the long yeah. one. And, and the I mean, long list I mean and, cer- and certainly the, the biggest think tanks, the ones whose names most people, if they can think of a think tank, can think of, take it. Brookings, CSIS, uh, uh, at the Heritage that's Foundation. A, that's the Center for, Center for Strategic and International, International Studies. Studies. Yeah, the Center for American Progress, the Hudson Institute. Uh, the American Enterprise Institute, they, they don't actually disclose any of their funding, but I've seen donor rolls from them that show them taking foreign government money. Um, it, is, it is the norm. It is not the exception for think tanks in Washington that are providing analysis to the general public and to politicians where there is an assumption that they are speaking from some position of a defined notion of American interests mm-hmm. are actually having their work funded in part by foreign governments. And they tend mm-hmm. not to be overly open about that fact or even acknowledge that there is a potential conflict of interest there. Okay, so let's look at Brookings quickly because it, it is thought of, it is, it's almost the most esteemed think tank. It's thought of as, I would say, if anything, vaguely liberal, although that's on the base of, basis of domestic policy analysis, I'd say. And in any event, it, it, it's it's thought of as not particularly partisan. Of all the buildings in Washington that think tanks are housed in, it even looks like the most kind of uh, august in a way. And <laughs> and and, and, and uh, so, what foreign countries uh, has Brookings taken money from, and how do you think that might influence the? Output. Yeah, well, I, I could talk about two examples. One is th- their biggest foreign funder, maybe one of their biggest funders overall, was Qatar, um, that they had a, a project in Qatar. Uh, they recently announced that they were going to end that. I think that there has been growing pressure on think tanks to, to pare back on their foreign funding. Um, and they have mm-hmm. chosen, after many years and tens of millions of dollars, I believe, to, to wind that down. Um, I think it's very interesting because, truthfully, that's one of the ones that I think didn't get as much criticism as others because, you know, Brookings really, I think, does aspire to some degree of, of independence in their work. Uh, doesn't mean that they that they that they're immune from influence, and I think it should have been disclosed more often. But they, they have chosen, I believe, to to bring that to a close. The, the funder that I looked at at Brookings more closely recently was the Taipei Economic and Cultural Relations Office, called TECRO, which is effectively Taiwan's embassy in Washington. Uh, And I looked at how they were giving money to a a number of think tanks, CSIS, Brookings, Center for American Progress, Hudson. And what I saw in the case of Brookings, which again was not, was far, was the norm with these think tanks, not the exception, is that they were regularly producing analysis about Taiwan and US Taiwan relations. They were regularly publishing op eds where their scholars were talking about uh, ways to advance and, and bring closer the relationship between. Taipei and Washington. Uh, And these views may or may not have been influenced by the money. That's not really the point. I'll never be able to prove it one way or the other, nor can they prove it one way or the other. The problem that I saw was that Brookings, alongside these other think tanks, wasn't disclosing that as a potential conflict of interest when they were writing these materials. It was never presented Mm -hmm. as something that the audience should just be made aware of. (laughs) It was never presented as something that you want to preemptively put out there to try right. to get ahead of the accusation that you're engaged in some sort of pay-to-play research. Uh, and I think, again, and, and, that's that's the culture in Washington, is that this isn't something that you need to disclose proactively. Right. And of course, this is in the context of a big debate about, like, should we defend Taiwan? Should we sell more weapons to Taiwan? I mean, should we defend Taiwan if they're attacked by China? Right. Should, should we end strategic ambiguity? Debate? Yeah. Right, right. Should we should we not commit to defending them or uh, and leave it leave it ambiguous? The the uh, and I want to be clear. My own view of this, and I, I I recently actually had a conversation with Thomas Wright of Brookings on my show because he contends there kind of is no coherent thing called the blob, and it's true it's not super coherent. But anyway, leave that argument aside. And I, I tried to explain to him that we are not saying that people like him 
are being paid to say specific things. We're saying that people like him are being hired because of their actual heartfelt opinions. They're not, they're not, they're not being asked to lie or misrepresent their genuine views. It's, it's just that think tanks. Uh, I mean, let's, let's take Quincy. Quincy is not going to hire Bob Kagan. You know, he's much more hawkish than anybody Quincy would hire. And you wouldn't deny that. It's, it's not, uh, uh, but, but, uh, but that does suggest that, uh, you know, uh, so, so it's not an indictment of the individuals who are no, professing the views. No. These are their views. But it does suggest that maybe it would be useful to know where the money is coming from as a way of understanding that, uh, you know, the, the views coming from this particular uh, think tank are not like randomly selected or anything, right? So, but, so that's but, but, that's. But, 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 but Bob, like I, I, I hear that. I, I agree with it. But my mind goes in a very different direction. And I, and I watched the interview with Thomas, right? Uh, and, and and I think it was interesting. I think it was also a, a series of arguments that I've heard a number of times um, about. Well, the money doesn't actually change these people's views, and I think you make a great point. They probably are hired already because they have certain views that conform right. to what is expected at the institution. But there's another aspect here, which again is this inside the beltway, outside the beltway standards. Outside the beltway, and I use that broadly, and to be clear, what I'm referring to here are journalistic standards and the standards that are used in academic journals. None of them ask, have you received funding? that may have changed your mind on this topic and shaped the article that you're writing. Because that yeah. is an unreasonable bar to use. I can't prove what goes on in somebody's head. You can't, no one can. What this question is getting at is, have you received funding? And again, journalistic outfits use this, academic journals, I've looked very closely at a number of the conflict of interest disclosures that academic journals use. Um, what they're asking is, do you have funds that, that could appear to be in conflict with or from sources that could stand to benefit from the mm -hmm. work that you are doing? And it doesn't mean you can't publish this work. It doesn't mean that they, would, that they won't take it. They're just saying it's in everybody's best interest if we lay this right. out. And in Washington, the argument that I've heard time and time and time again is, yeah, but the money didn't change anyone's mind. To which you can get pulled into the debate of saying, oh, well, I think it did. And I would say that y you've fallen for it then. <laughs> and I think a lot of people do. Well, of course, the that's money the changes same thing. Minds. That's Okay, but you understand that's the same thing I'm saying. Yeah, no, I agree with you. I, 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 say, I say you, I say broadly, that, that that's the rebuttal I so often get. And, and, I, and I saw you dealing with that with, with, with Tom, that you know, that's yeah. not the argument we need to be having. We need to be having an argument of what are realistic standards? What are standards right. that actually are expected everywhere else? except in Washington. Right. Now, it is challenging because, uh, you know, with academics, it's a straightforward question. Has this work been supported by a grant from a pharmaceutical company? You might even go back further and say, has your other work been? So who knows? But with think tanks, the connection is often a little more oblique. Now, sometimes there is a dedicated chair at a think tank that is funded by, say, Saudi Arabia or, or some rich person uh, in America or whatever. But often it's not that straightforward. It's like money comes into the think tank from different sources and the it, it, it may not be clear, certainly based on public documents, and it may not even be so clear internally uh, which sources of money are going to which particular think tanker, you know, which particular thinker. So it is it is a challenging disclosure issue, but at the same time, I mean, the public, not, not just the public, but journalists who call these experts and get their opinions seem to me either incredibly naive or willfully in denial. I mean, I did a piece uh, for The Intercept. It's several years old, uh, but I think it, it still has some relevant. And they gave it the headline, I mean, in, in an attempt to get me... Uh, into as much trouble as they could. <laughs> um, they gave it the headline, uh, I think, how the New York Times is making war with Iran, more likely, but I, I, it's an accurate headline. 
uh, because I, I was arguing that if you look at who, I just took one big front page piece with like several authors on the New York Times uh, about Iran and Israel. And I said, look at the experts they're quoting and where they're coming from and who gives the money to these and these journalists. And actually, I, I, I'd like to ask you about one of these think tanks because I, I want there's a point I want to make about that think tank and Brookings. I have an anecdote about a particular naive journalist at NPR that I can only tell if you talk about uh, the think, if you first talk about the think tank that a lot of the experts quoted in this New York Times piece were at, which is the Foundation for, for Defense of Democracies. Yeah, I, so can you talk I, I, about I could, that? I could tell that's where we were going. Uh, FDD, I've looked at them very closely over the years. Um, I, I, I have in the past dis- uh, uh, managed to get donor roles of them that are more comprehensive. Uh, long story short, some of their biggest funders, and I believe they're currently their biggest funder, is Bernie Marcus. He's the co-founder of Home Depot. Uh, he sits on their board. He has some pretty radical views. He's, he's talked about, for instance, blaming uh, uh, in some of the more darkest stuff I've seen of him. He actually talks about how uh, the Jews that died in the Holocaust were were weak Jews and that the Israeli Jews, uh, of course, there's a timeline issue here, wouldn't have, uh, wouldn't have marched off to their own deaths. Um, so it's a very bleak, stark view of the world. With I mean, we should say that for Israel. whatever... We should say, Eli, we should say, uh, for whatever it's worth, uh, he is Jewish, right? I mean, just to get yes, yes. If, if people are judging, like, yes. you know, if they Absolutely. consider that relevant, fine. If they Clearly, don't, it's fine. rooted in his own, his own experiences. Um, but what, where I get to here is that, you know, one of the qualities of FDD that, you know, I, I don't think, um, you know, we can talk more about their funding. Sheldon Adelson has been a big funder. Uh, at the end of the day, some of the biggest funders to Donald Trump's uh, pr- presidential campaign were also the biggest funders to FDD. And FDD has actively been pushing against uh, efforts for there to be diplomacy with Iran that could constrain its nuclear program uh, going, going well back over the past uh, two decades. Uh, they've been very consistent on that. And they are very close to uh, the Israeli Likud party, I should say, not just Israel, but the Likud party and Benjamin Netanyahu. Um, one of the qualities that drives me crazy, and I want to hear about your anecdote in a moment, but I think this feeds into it, about FDD and how it's talked about in the media, is that FDD lies or chooses to be only partially truthful about what they are. Because what they tell the IRS is different than what they see on their website and how journalists typically refer to them. They are referred to very often as a foreign policy think tank. Uh, maybe even a hawkish foreign policy think tank, a militarist foreign policy think tank. Uh, you probably have some other ones that you've seen them be called by. Um, the thing that they never get called out as is the thing that they have told the IRS they are, which is they exist for, among other purposes, to promote and advance Israel's image in North America. They actually exist yeah. to promote a foreign country's interests. Again, nothing inherently illegal, nothing inherently unethical. But to not disclose that, to say that these people are speaking from a point of just wanting to advance U.S. interests when they have told the IRS their purpose in existence is actually to do some other things as well, borders to me on that's journalistic malpractice. Yeah, yeah. people want to read more about uh, FDD and its funding and ideology. John Judas did a piece for Slate some years ago in which I think he cited your work called uh, the little think tank that could or something. It's good. And it's, you know, John is not, you know, he's, he's a very, he has an ideological perspective. He's on the left, but, uh, but he really tries hard to be fair. And uh, I thought it was a good profile of the think tank. And so, yeah, you're right. They're very, you know, it's almost an ant, I would call it almost an anti-Iran think tank or an anti-Iranian government think tank, they might say. We're not, they would say we're not against the people of Iran or whatever, but it's they're pro, it's they're, really, they're pro regime change. Yeah, yeah. They're it's their overriding focus. And I mean, they are quoted in the New York Times all the time as just these these people uh who these experts, and, and by the way, they are good at actually having they know what reporters want. They get a they get a hold. They have like interesting information. Like if I were a reporter, it would be an efficient phone call for me to go to FDD. They have sometimes actual data that other people don't have. They have interesting, they have provocative ways of saying things. So, um, you know, and that's all part of the game. So, so my anecdote, uh, 
is to, I have to set it up a little further. This was like mm, close to 10 years. This was a while ago. So we were, it was more in the aftermath of the Iraq war. And Brookings had really, I think, uh, played a big role in, in, frankly, getting us into the Iraq war. I, I mean, if you, if you look at the people, what was the book, uh, The Gathering Storm or whatever, by uh, Ken Pollock? Is that? Uh, that sounds right, yeah. 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 Uh, he was at Brookings. Uh, what's his name? O'Hanlon was at Brookings. And we, he was like the military analyst mm-hmm. who was very pro. Anyway. Brookings, partly because of its reputation as this, you know, kind of above it all think tank, had been, I think, pretty influential in getting us into the Iraq war. I, I don't know. I have noticed that some of the, the most, some of the people who most fit that ideological uh, profile have since left and gone to places where they more obviously belong. Like Ken Pollock is now at AI, uh, American Enterprise Institute. This guy who, I don't know if he was there then, but he was at Brookings for a while. Uh, what's his name? His Twitter handle is Doranimated. Oh, Michael, Michael Doran. Is, He's now at Hudson, isn't right. he? Right. Yeah. Exactly. Where he kind of belongs, right? But there was a time when all these people who are kind of like real hawks were at Brookings. Mm-hmm. And and so anyway, that's the, the, the time when this anecdote happens. I, I can't disclose the reporter I was talking to. Longtime listeners of NPR would definitely recognize the name. This was like a major foreign policy reporter for NPR. And I was uh, I was doing an event with this reporter. I'm, I'm taking pains not to reveal gender. I want no clues whatsoever. <laughs> um, uh, uh, talking to a class uh, of college students uh, with a, uh, the professor who invited us both there. And uh, I said... I was explaining uh, about FDD, mm-hmm. and I and I used the classic Sheldon Adelson anecdote. Like Shel- he's no longer alive. I said he is a funder, and he has literally recommended dropping a nuclear bomb on Iran. As he put it, just drop it in the desert to show him we mean business. Right, you know, you right. don't kill anybody. Just, just you know, a little demo. Um, and this this reporter said, "Oh, it was like a lot had been totally unaware." totally unaware of FDD's funding background, Mm -hmm. and then said, well, okay, but, you know, (laughs) it's a good, but, but, you know, whenever I talk to someone from FDD, you know, I counterbalance it. I also talk to someone from Brookings. (laughs) And that was this reporter's conception of, like, the whole spectrum, right? Brookings, which had worked to get us into the... uh, well, work is maybe unfair, it was very hawkish militarily. And FDD, which was even more hawkish. This is a major NPR reporter who had no clue, no right. idea. And uh, I, I, don't, <laughs> I don't know. And, you know, the funding, I don't know, you, this was maybe before you're looking into funding at Brookings. Their, funding, their whole funding profile has changed since then. Uh, but... Um, but, anyway, you know, but I think, that's my but I think, but I think this this <laughs> gets to the fact that you know even suggesting these things is considered uncouth. It's not what you're supposed to do. Um, suggesting that a think tank has a certain leaning is something that they will actively push back on and say, "Well, we don't take institutional positions," which is largely true in a formal sense. In mm-hmm. an informal one, well, you know, okay, FDD doesn't really take formal positions. They just have everybody singing from, you know, the same lines. Uh, and if you start to ask questions about, well, you know, who funds you, or uh, I want to talk about who funds you, or I think it's relevant who funds you, um, or I think it's relevant that there's a certain strain of thinking that seems to run through this think tank, you're very actively pushed back against. You know, that, that's considered outside the norms of the acceptable debate at least inside the Beltway. Uh, it's really mm-hmm. kind of shocking how strong a reaction one can get by, by asking those simple sorts of questions. Yeah, so, okay, so we could go through this either interest group by interest group or think tank by think tank. Let's do some interest groups. We haven't talked about the arms industry as funders. We've talked about one Arab state, Qatar, 
Uh, mm-hmm. We've talked about, you know, the so-called, you know, pro-Israel money or whatever you, you want to call it. There are other Arab states we should talk about uh, because they're they're probably more influential than, than, than Qatar. But let's talk about a big one, just the arms industry. Like, yeah. uh, how is it, this is, I assume, mainly direct uh, money from individual arms making corporations and it goes and, and what are the the think tanks that are like the biggest recipients or what are the most uh seemingly obvious influences or what what do you want to say about the military industrial complex? you know I, I think again just like i when i was talking about foreign funding the the thing that's so shocking to me is that it's not that there's one or two think tanks that take this money and don't think it's an issue it's that that's the standard you know, uh, CSIS takes the money. Brookings does, I believe. Uh, I know Heritage does because I've seen them taking money from from even foreign arms manufacturers. Um, uh, Do you remember which uh, ones? I'm, I'm... Uh, Heritage. I'm, yeah, I'll, be, I'll get into that in just a moment. Uh, the Center for New American Security obviously takes quite a bit of defense money. Uh, and again, this is mm-hmm. not something that I'm actually big on taking a position on one way or another. What I think, again, is really unacceptable, though, is that when you're writing reports, producing op-eds that are beneficial, potentially, to the weapons industry, that is something that I think should be disclosed proactively because it actually makes your arguments stronger because you are saying, I want to get this out of the way, that these are who our funders are. They didn't have any influence over me. You can talk about that all you want. uh, And here's my thoughts. Uh, but that is simply not the way it's done. It is, at this point, a standard in Washington that if you are a major think tank, you are taking money from the top five uh, 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 weapons manufacturers. Uh, to go back like to Heritage Raytheon, for one, Raytheon, yeah. Lockheed, Northrop, General Dynamics, Boeing. Um, and if, if you go back to Heritage, you know I think this is just an absolutely crazy story, but, but a, good, a good example maybe of just how out of hand things have gotten. That I, you know, I went and looked, uh, uh, I wrote an article about this, I guess it was last year probably, uh, about how, I think I wrote it with uh, the American conservative and with responsible statecraft, uh, talking about how they had quietly been taking, uh, I think it was several million dollars, I think it was over $5 million I tallied up, from a Korean, Chaebol, Chaebol, one of these Korean uh, major corporations uh, that have a variety of business interests. The one that I was looking at was called the Hanwha Group, H-A-N-W-H-A, for people who want to take a closer look. And Hanwha had been a longtime funder of Heritage. Heritage has very little on their website about Hanwha. It's not something they really talk about very much. On the other hand, in Korea, the Hanwha group talks a lot about Heritage. They put out a press release every time they they had people coming from Heritage to visit with them. They were openly talking about how Heritage was going to help bring them closer to the Trump administration. There was even boasting about how Heritage had uh, served as uh, in some sort of intermediary to guarantee that the head of the Chai Ball Group was uh, invited to Trump's inauguration. And the Hanwha Group has a longstanding interest in uh, weapons. They make landmines, cluster munitions, and they also make uh, uh, a, a autonomous killing robot. Uh, and they Heritage, in turn, has written quite a bit opposing efforts, international efforts, as well as domestic ones, to put limitations on the manufacturing, sale, and use of cluster munitions and landmines, uh, items which Hanwha produces and which, especially the landmines, are used on the DMZ between North and South Korea. But things get really crazy with this autonomous uh, sentry robot, which uh, is capable of, it has a machine gun and a grenade launcher, and it can be uh, set up so uh, there was a person on the other end of it who, if you identify yourself to the robot, uh, a person will uh, hear that identification, make a decision about what the robot should do. But the fun thing is it, it it actually can also, or the really scary thing I should say, is that you can actually set it fully loose on its own. So this is potentially something they would have put on the DMZ. So it, it makes it, you can have it make its own decisions about who to throw the hand grenade at. Yeah. The robot. Yeah. With and, via AI. Yeah. Yeah. And this was potentially going to be deployed on the DMZ, you know, where it could start World War III. <laughs> Oh, great. <laughs> and Heritage had been writing stuff, including citing this specific robot about efforts to put sort of limitations on the use of autonomous killing machines because of, you know, the threat of them doing things like starting World War Three, and right. uh, opposing it. And they had never disclosed that one of their funders, they actually have a, have a conference room named after the, Her- the Hanwha Group's founder, uh, 
identifying that they you know, had a slight financial interest in this topic, given that it, a, a year after year had actually been one of their top funders had been the Hanwha Group. Uh, and and mm-hmm. you know, I wrote about this. Some people thought that was interesting. It doesn't really permeate, though, beyond that, because I think partially people are cynical and expect it. But also, I think to a large degree, people don't pay attention or care that much. Uh, so I think that, that, that that's sort of a good microcosm example of, of the problem. Uh, and that was a really extreme one. That was a foreign weapons manufacturer that was shoveling money into Heritage, and Heritage, in turn, was shoveling out op-eds and reports that were hugely beneficial to this company. Mm-hmm. Oh, and it may have started and World you know, War you, <laughs> There's that. Uh, you mentioned uh, along the way CNAS, the Center for New American Security, and what's notable about, you know, as a, as a big recipient of, of arms money, and what's notable about that is it styles itself as, you know, liberal, maybe vaguely, you know, uh, and that, and it's very closely connected to the Democratic establishment. I think one of its co-founders did go into the uh, the Biden administration, I believe, Kurt Campbell, uh, I think is something or other in China. Uh, another of the uh, founders, oh, what's her name, Michelle Flournoy, mm-hmm. was poised to go, but progressives, I think, uh, to go into the Biden administration, but I think progressives kicked up enough of a fuss that I gather, you know, she was kind of uh, that was short circuited. But 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 the point is, the arms the arms money is going. You know, it's it's bipartisan. It's going to think tanks that call that you think of as conservative. Some that work hard to not be thought of as conservative. Uh, but it goes. The money goes to pretty much all of them, and there are it shapes not only like op-ed uh, pages, but uh, you know these there's this symbiotic connection between the think tanks and whatever administration is in power. By and large, you know, and, and it's kind of a revolving door. I, I mean, yeah. you know, uh, they'll they'll you know you leave an administration, you find a think tank as a perch, you go back into an administration. And while you're at the think tank, you're almost certainly getting money that is not from a disinterested source. That's, that's absolutely right. And, you know, let's let's be even more clear here. This is effectively a form of dark money. Um, you know, to really get into the nuts and bolts here now, think tanks don't actually have a legal designation. You know, we talk about them. We, you, you would know a think tank if you saw one, right? But, but in terms of the IRS... Uh, it, it doesn't have a, a unique uh, code or... Uh, it, it's or, like or, other nonprofits, other 501c3s usually. Is that what they are? Usually C3s. Some of them have a C4 attached. Uh, but yeah, the vast majority of them are 501c3s, which is pretty much every nonprofit mm-hmm. in this country. Um, so it's very hard to even talk about them as a as something that you would regulate. Um, I, think, I think we should, but uh, it, it, it's a heavy lift because they, they, they're not actually a defined uh, thing. Uh, and, and how you would legally define one is, is a good question. But to get into that 501c3 designation, I'm glad you brought that up. Um, you know, th- there was a misnomer that 501c3s, nonprofits, uh, you know, th- it's true that they, they do need to file a disclosure called the 990 tax form. And people think, oh, well, they're a nonprofit. They don't pay taxes on, or they give people a tax uh, uh, deduction for contributing to them. That must mean that they have to disclose their funders in the 990. They do not. There is no mandatory disclosure of funding for nonprofits at all. Think tanks. But do the givers, uh, do the givers, the donors have to disclose? I mean, how do you go about finding out, following the money? Is it that if you look at the donors, there are some public documents about them giving to the think tanks or what? Not as a rule, no. Because... The, the situation in which you might be able to see it, and which I use a lot, is looking in the pool of 990s and finding private foundations or other charitable foundations that are giving grants. So those are the outgoing money from another 501c3. And as a rule, 990s, as the, the best rule to understand the 990 is it shows where money goes. It doesn't show where it comes from. Right, so you can right. find the outgoing funds going to think tanks and other entities. An easy okay. way around that is to write a personal check. If you give, you know, if you gave fifty dollars to Quincy, that would not. There was no mandatory disclosure where that would show up. You would take the deduction mm-hmm. on your personal tax return, and that would be that. There's no mandatory disclosure of that. Now, sometimes I've gotten donor rolls through other means 
uh, that do disclose that. But that is not something that you are guaranteed. It is not something they are required to do. And that creates this ent- that these entities in Washington that are you know, ch- churning through hundreds of millions of dollars a year, these think tanks, are actually an amazing source of dark money influencing U.S. policy. And, and just, you know, mm-hmm. again, to sort of put this a little more in context, one of the pieces I worked on was about uh, uh, think tanks testifying before just the House Foreign Affairs Committee uh, over the past two Congresses. And, well, you know, I found that, you know, of the, there were like 237 uh, think tank affiliated witnesses. And uh, I, less than a third came from think tanks that disclosed their, that fully disclosed their funders. The two thirds of them, I think it was 70%. Came from think tanks that 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 either partially disclosed, and I use partially disclosed. I define that as that some think tanks say we disclose all our funders, and then they have you know, their million dollar, their five hundred thousand dollar funders, and they'll just say anonymous as a line item. Yeah, you know somebody didn't want to disclose, so they're not going to disclose it. Okay, well, yeah, Quincy doesn't do that, but that is actually really common. Uh, and the, the top fund, the, just just to tell you, the top uh, think tanks that testified was CSIS, who, who does actually disclose in, in a pretty comprehensive way. They to do. Their credit. Okay, that's good. The great. Heritage Foundation, who will selectively disclose, they'll just say we had five anonymous donors at the million dollar level. Uh, mm. They feel like it. Uh, that's the Washington, a the Washington Institute for Near East Policy, uh, which does not disclose any of their funders, and the Foundation for Defense of Democracies, which does not disclose any of their funders. Uh, and these people are getting to talk directly to Congress. There's an assumption, again, that they're speaking to some notion of U.S. national interests in a way that is not defined by them, that's for sure. Uh, they are mm-hmm. seen as these objective witnesses, these objective experts, and we don't actually know who funds them. Yeah. So let's talk about, okay, so you got your arms industry. I said we should talk about some other Arab states because you know, it's not like they're all on the same page. And in fact, Qatar and Saudi Arabia, for example, or or UAE are on, not infrequently on somewhat different pages. And even have, there has been even uh, antagonism, say, between Saudi Arabia and Qatar. Um, I gather, it, it, it seems to me that over the last, I don't know, what, 10, 20 years, Saudi and UAE have become bigger players or tried to become bigger players? You tell me. And, and what is the, uh, I th- how I think does the, it look? Yeah, I think the vast majority of the growth, uh, certainly in think tank funding, uh, if that's where we're focused on, I think we should broaden that, that focus in just a moment, but uh, is UAE. Um, I think the biggest think tank giver is my, my good friend, Ben Freeman, Center for International Policy, did a report where he looked at you know, who are the biggest foreign funders of think tanks it, this thing was sort of in over the past, I think it was 2014, 2015 to 2018 or 2019. And, and I think it was led by Norway and the UK. That's longstanding. Uh, and I think it was followed by the UAE. And I don't think that UAE was giving at that level 10 years before that. Mm-hmm. Uh, I think that that's been, you know, and I think that they also represent in many ways Saudi interests in Washington. Uh, they're mm-hmm. very good about, you know, making sure that those arms sales go through uh, you see the think tanks that are funded by them very often talking about that we need to be selling more weapons and giving a congressional approval for arms sale packages uh, to uh, our partners, as they would put it, in the Middle East, which is nearly always UAE and Saudi Arabia as the biggest buyers. Uh, so I, I think UAE really has gone big, and I think credit where credit is due, uh, UAE Ambassador Yusuf al Taiba is, 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 is loved in the think tank world. I've seen that at the Center for American Progress where I used to be. Uh, and I've seen it also, you know, through his emails that I guess were stolen and I've reported on it. You know, he, a lot of the Washington press corps loves him too. He's always there to give a quote. He's friendly. He's always got the good table at Cafe Milano. He's always throwing the best parties. And if you're really nice to him, he'll, I guess, fly you to the UAE for their Formula One race in Abu Dhabi, uh, which is you know a big part of the UAE junket process. Um, Mm -hmm. So I think that, you know, he's been very smart in spreading his money around and not just limiting it to straightforward lobbying, which they spend plenty of money on, too, and and hiring, you know, consultancies and communication firms that that file under the Foreign Agent Registration Act. But he's also really spread that money around to to a variety of think tanks who are producing, again, this this these works and this research that is uh, assumed to be. Uh, speaking for you know some notion of what are in U.S. national security interests or U.S. foreign policy interests writ large, uh, and, and and not that of the UAE. And you know, UAE and Saudi 
have in common a certain antagonism, I mean, correct me if I'm wrong, toward Iran historically. Uh, in that sense, they're, you know, often, well, sometimes on the same page as, as uh, say, FDD. I mean, we don't know if, if Foundation for Defense of Democracies has gotten money from them. But but anyway, there is this distinction between them on the one hand and, and Qatar on the other hand. And of course, a big manifestation of the antagonism toward Iran is the Saudi and UAE involvement in Yemen. I don't know what the exact current state of it is, but basically, you know, they 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 amped up hostilities there tremendously by intervening now now years ago, uh, and uh, and and the connection to Iran is is they see that as a as a proxy war with Iran that they see Iran as being uh, deeply influential in Yemen. They may have been initially actually overestimating the extent of Iranian involvement, but whatever, both both Iran and Saudi Arabia are now involved in Yemen, certainly as, as UAE is. And, and the point is, you know, this has been horrifically uh, bloody, uh, even leaving aside the effect of, of the kind of like whatever it is, the sanctions and blockade regime that's, that has uh, kept people in Yemen from, uh, you know, from getting access to, to food and drinking water and various other things. It's been on humanitarian along humanitarian lines, you know, uh, a, a, a big and awful thing. And the U.S. has been involved, and, and that's been an issue for U.S. policy. They have been, they uh, beginning with the Obama administration, they supported, as a practical matter, the Saudi intervention with logistical support and so on. Biden says he's done, he's changed it in some significant way. I think it's it's unclear what the actual impact of that is, um, but the point is, you know, this is this is a really important American policy. Like our our, you know, we supported a probably, you know, indefensible military intervention that has been disastrous in humanitarian terms, and uh, you know, Saudi and UAE money, no doubt, has gone to shape the foreign policy discourse you know, around the question of what our involvement there should be. Absolutely. And, and I think that, you know, you, you don't have to go looking too far to see where their points of influence are. Some of it is actually laid out in these FARA filings. Uh, you know, you see uh, Norm Coleman, for instance, uh, was he a former congressman from Minnesota? Um, or was he a senator? Um, I and think, he, I think a senator, but I'm not he's sure. senator. And, uh, you know, he's been a Saudi lobbyist, I believe, through Hogan Lovell. And, you know, he sits at the top of, you know, and, and not to pick on the Republican Party here, I think the Democrats have been pretty bad on this as well, especially in terms of trying to get U.S. support for the war in Yemen uh, uh, to be rolled back. Um, but, you know, I've seen the emails from Norm Coleman where he, he, they said they're sending out Saudi lobbyists are sending out stuff to members of Congress saying, hey, look at how great we're uh, the, 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 the Saudis are being about about trying to, you know, get food aid into Yemen, which I, I don't think they've done to any successful degree uh, or in a meaningful manner. Uh, you know, that we, too, are concerned about the humanitarian crisis, which is pretty ridiculous when you're bombing people. Um, and. But let's look at who Norm Coleman is. He sits at the top of the Republican Party's campaign finance apparatus. He's the guy mm -hmm. who makes the ass, who used to make the ask of Sheldon Adelson uh, to give you know tens, a hundred million dollars in the midterms. Uh, he's the guy who sits uh, at the top of. I think he founded one of the Republican Party's biggest super PACs. And the fact that he gets to uh, you know wear both these hats is really kind of striking. And nobody talks about the fact that the Republican Party, possibly the Republican Party's biggest fundraiser, uh, is a Saudi op operative. And he's a Saudi lobbyist. Uh, he's registered on the Foreign Agent Registration Act as that. The amazing thing is he actually was asked about this by, it, it didn't get a lot of attention, but a local, uh, it was, I think it may have been after uh, the Khashoggi murder. And uh, a, a television station in, in, I think it was in, in Minnesota, I think in Minneapolis, St. Paul, you know, sort of threw him that softball question of, well, what what do you tell your uh, your 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 clients in Saudi Arabia? Um, you know, obviously they're facing a lot of backlash right now, and you know, every other lobbyist that I'd seen at that point, Saudi lobbyists and people that worked for Saudi Arabia, were you know they had the line down pat, which is that, well, you know, we give them our best advice, 
We tell them that human rights are important and, uh, you know, I, we can't be held responsible for what they do. You know, all we can offer is our best advice. That's what we're paid for is to give good advice, right? It's a good answer. It's easy. It's straightforward. You take no responsibility. Norm Coleman went a different direction. He said, my job isn't to tell the Saudis what their policy should be. My job is to communicate to members of Congress what the Saudi policy is. Yeah. Yeah. It's, uh, and I mean, I suppose, <laughs> I, I don't even, uh, I, I don't even know what connections there are from these various, uh, between these various funders and existing uh, members of Congress. I mean, there are, one can imagine, but it, it may be that with foreign funders, it's kind of a heavier lift because of legal restrictions to actually directly, but I don't know. I, I mean, I guess not. I guess you're saying I'm wrong. Right? I mean, well, I mean, uh, yeah, I think I think with Saudi Arabia, it's right there. I think with Israel, it's also right there. And, and again, not to pick on the Republican Party, but I just think it's a little more in the open there. Uh, you know, you look at Sheldon Adelson, Sheldon and Miriam Adelson, uh, you know, have you know, numerous Republican politicians, including most Donald Trump has talked about it. I think Newt Gingrich has talked about it, have said, hey, these guys' interest is Israel. Uh, that's why they are the biggest funders of Republican presidential candidates. It's why they're the biggest funders, or at least have been, of the Republican Party. Uh, and, and and asking those tough questions about, well, what does that influence look like doesn't really happen that often, even when it's really staring you in the face. And, and one of the most just egregious, and I think in your rubbing, rubbing it in our face moments happened, uh, I guess it must have been in uh, December or January, when Jonathan Pollard, the convicted Israeli spy, uh, uh, was was released from his, I guess he was on probation, uh, and was permitted to leave the country, given his passport back uh, by 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 the by the Trump administration. This is something that uh, Sheldon and Mary Madison had had openly advocated for. Um, this is something that the intelligence services of the United States have consistently opposed because they say that he did a great deal of damage in selling U.S. secrets to Israel, um, and he was permitted to leave the country. Now, in most cases, you would think he would have quietly left, sort of in the middle of the night, uh, you know, and gone to Israel, which is where he ultimately went to and wanted to go to. And, and, and that would have been that because it's kind of embarrassing for all parties involved. But that's not what happened. He was flown on a private jet. And I, I saw this private jet land, uh, the photos of it landing in Tel Aviv. And I said, I know that jet. I've been tracking these planes. I know who owns that plane. That's Sheldon, Sheldon. Adelson's plane. <laughs> Sheldon Adelson flew the big, Republican Party's biggest funder. He's now deceased. Uh, flew Jonathan Pollard, a convicted spy, to Israel, where he was greeted on the tarmac by Benjamin Netanyahu. This that is in your big, face, was, and, and they're kind of thumbing their nose at our unwillingness to talk about what is clearly in the open here. It's it's pretty staggering. Yeah, that was, a. Uh, I didn't quite understand the intensity of Israel's longstanding interest in getting him released, but it, w- it was certainly a big, it was certainly a big campaign. So let's um, let's talk about uh, some other issue areas where it might be like less obvious uh, what the connection of money is. And maybe there isn't one that you can discern. I'm genuinely kind of ignorant about a lot of these matters. Let me just mention a few areas like uh, where I know there are lobbies in one sense or another. Right. Like uh, so Cuba. There's there, there's a there's a, a Cuba lobby at least in the sense that there are a number of Cuban Am- Americans in Florida, which happens to be a, just an important state mm-hmm. in in American elections, and they're they're very opposed to the Cuban regime. I guess there's even kind of a discer- discernible uh, Venezuelan lobby, which again is maybe largely kind of an ethnic thing. I don't know Venezuelan Americans who have uh, strong views. Uh, against the regime by and large and and want to make their influence felt. There's also uh, Russia, right? Like, and and I know there, there's a, there was at one point supposedly an ethnic component when, when NATO enlargement was happening, which of course Russia didn't like, uh, I I think one of the, it was said to be partly uh, an attempt to court uh, Polish American voters in the Midwest or something or in Chicago. I, I, I don't know the details. But in all of these cases, you can say there's maybe an ethnic component. To what extent do you see, separate from that, separate from kind of voters and even 
uh, you know, ind- even affluent individuals in these groups who are maybe making contributions to individual politicians. To what extent, with any of these issues, do you see something that wouldn't that 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 I wouldn't be able to guess? Where, like maybe even money flowing into think tanks or whatever. Mm-hmm. You know, I think in those cases, uh, it, certainly to focus on obviously the Venezuelan community and the Cuban uh, community. I, I think that electoral politics probably explains a great deal of it. Um, right. So I'll, I'll say that at first to sort of downplay sometimes the degree of influence that money can have in these matters. Uh, I, I think it, it ultimately does hijack U.S. foreign policy in ways that might not be what the American public actually would like or what actually serves a broader sense of U.S. interests as opposed to some sort of score settling, which I very think, which, which I think is very often what drives some of these uh, uh folks who, who want to maintain an antagonistic U.S. relationship, especially toward Cuba. But, but you know, to look at another one where I think probably small amounts of money uh, do, and it gets back to your point that, that it doesn't take that much money to influence U.S. foreign policy and that it's very easy to influence it through, in, through interest groups, would be to look at the Mojahedina Kalk, the, the Iranian dissident group known as the MEK. Um, they're, they're a cult, uh, um, according to many accounts of uh, in, in, you know, isolate their members. And they and uh, they were on our terrorist list they until were. I think Hillary Clinton as Secretary of yep. State delisted them and, and took them off. They, they had right. killed Americans or something. They, they had but, killed Americans. Yeah. So go um, ahead. And they, you know, they, they get uh, American politicians to speak at their events, usually in Paris. Um, they pay them quite a lot of money, tens of thousands of dollars in some cases. And uh, Mike Pence just spoke for them. Uh, and, and I think you know, that is a good example of where, OK, whether or not the MEK is able to move the needle on U.S.-Iran policy, I, I think that on the margins, they probably have some influence. Um, but more and they over, favor a regime. They, we should say they favor regime change in Iran. Yes. Right? Well, yes. And, and they claim that there's no scenario. I mean, I've, I've spoken with them. They claim that what they want is a democratic election in Iran. And they are confident that if there were a democratic election in Iran, that Maryam Rajavi... Uh, their de facto leader would be elected. And, and I've asked okay. them, you, could you anticipate a scenario where there was a democratic election and she would not be elected? And they, they said that, they, that, that, okay. was, that was impossible. Uh, They've uh, also been implicated, I think, in, have they, uh, they, it's been suggested that they are proxies, they're involved in some Israeli uh, yes. actions within Iran, like yeah, killing, killing nuclear scientists, people. I believe. Yeah, yeah. Okay. go ahead. Uh, at least in the past. I don't know if they've been involved in that more recently. Uh, the last, at least the last assassination seemed to have been strict, strictly an Israeli one. Uh, mm-hmm. But the, the fact that these politicians are willing to go talk and give them that, that, that credibility uh, and pay very little cost for speaking to a cult who mistreats its members, uh, who, you know, for instance, make husbands and wives split up, um, uh, en- engage in really extreme forms of control over their members, and who represent a, a, a diaspora dissident group who probably have very little uh, legitimacy or influence inside Iran, but keep alive this fiction that they are the true democratic government of Iran, um, it is a good example of how you know, politicians can take this money, uh, s- associate with kind of extreme groups, espousing extreme views, and pay very little price for doing so. You know, when, when Howard Dean goes and speaks for them, when Rudy Giuliani goes and speaks for them, when Mike Pence goes and speaks for them, uh, if, among other things, they may truly believe this stuff. They might not. But the point is, is that they they feel that they will pay very little cost for doing so. Uh, and I think that that probably does explain a, a number of these, uh, you know, small, you know, dissident groups, how they're able to gain degrees of influence in Washington is that the mm-hmm. cost of associating with them, even if they have extreme views, tends to be relatively low. Mm-hmm. Now, on the Russia front, uh, I have heard on the left, the, the kind of far left, uh, you hear, um, I've heard like the Atlantic Council, a think tank, referred to as, quote, NATO's think tank. I guess what they mean is that it gets money from European countries. And of course, uh, you know, these would be people who, well, at a minimum would would have been against NATO expansion, would, but would also be these people on the left who are saying this uh, would be against various uh, probably uh, policies that of NATO's that they consider confrontational. They'd probably just assume NATO didn't exist, whatever. But 
here you're talking about European money, I gather, mm-hmm. right? Yep. Yeah, and, and I think that there's you know a, a lot of it that that does um, at least flow into think tanks in Washington. I've seen some of the research proposals that get circulated, and a lot of it does have to do with research on NATO. Uh, I, I think it is probably uh, uh, it instills a certain form of bias towards uh, at least the. Uh, uh, usefulness of NATO, as well as perhaps an open-mindedness toward uh, NATO expansion. Uh, I'm speculating mm-hmm. here. Uh, I, I think that it has become more and more accepted in Washington, the notion that NATO expansion could actually come at very high cost, and it's something that we should be wary, be wary of. Uh, I, I think 10 years ago, the attitudes toward NATO expansion were, in a sense, far more uh, Casual, I think, is the word that comes to mind, you know, where it was just openly discussed. Well, hey, that seems like a good idea. Uh, And I think right now, I think that there is growing pushback against it. But, you know, there is, uh, for lack of a better term, a NATO lobby, I think, in Washington. Uh, In a Mm -hmm. sense, at least I could defend it a little more than some of these other foreign lobbies because, hey, the United States is a member of NATO. So at least we're somehow tied up in it. When you have foreign countries that, you know, we, we don't have a, a, a direct involvement in, uh, or at least not formally, uh, I think it concerns me a little more. But I, yeah, I think NATO, it, it can be hugely problematic. It can be uh, a hugely destabilizing force, especially if the alliance is expanded in some provocative ways. Uh, and and the, stu- the study of NATO and it, it as a discipline in Washington has become institutionalized. And I think that that is a result of of funding from not from the United States. It's from NATO partners funding that study and 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 that research at, at think tanks. Mm-hmm. Okay. Um, well, we've been talking for at least as long as we usually talk. I have a couple more quick things I want to get to. Um, or well, one is is just I don't think you have the answer to this question, but. Uh, I've long wondered about national review, which is extremely hawkish. And, uh, you know, it's conservative, but it's also hawkish. And you don't have to be hawkish as a conservative. The American conservative has historically been a magazine that's much less hawkish. Um, uh, They are funded by some kind of foundation, I think. But I guess we don't know. uh, Do we not know where the... I I think in the past, at least, uh, Paul Singer has has been a funder, is my recollection. Uh, he's a billionaire. He's a Republican uh, bundler and mega donor, uh, and and he's also he's, he's a neoconservative. He was a major funder of the Foundation for Defense of Democracies. Um, and, and was he a funder of the Weekly Standard for a while, uh, or not? I don't know. If Maybe he not. Never mind. He, he funded Free Beacon. Okay. Oh, okay. Well, that's hardcore. Yeah. Uh, okay. Um, yeah. I mean, that, yeah, I would call that. <laughs> well. Well, who needs my commentary? <laughs> I, I, w- I would not. I would not even call dignify that with the term journalism. To be perfectly honest with you, I mean it's so yeah. um, so talking pointish, uh, borderline propagandistic. <laughs> not that there aren't things like that on the left, but I mean, let's be honest. Yeah. It's not. It's not even in the same category as the Weekly Standard or or oh no or, or National Review. Um. Okay. Uh. So there's that. Uh, what else did I? Oh, y- early on, I felt I kind of interrupted you when you were um, saying, talking about the Quincy Institute, sounded like maybe you wanted to say more, but I took us off on a tangent. Do, I don't suppose you remember, do you, do you feel as if you were interrupted? And uh, Oh, uh, I think I was anything? discussing, you know, that we've tried to Listen, we're open to other discussions and suggestions about ways to avoid conflicts of interest and the influence of funders. Um, what uh, our measures that we've taken, which I think are actually unusual in Washington, is that we've said we don't take foreign government funding. We ask our uh, staff not to take honoraria from foreign governments. Uh, that's a major point at which you know you see a lot of think tankers go on those uh, trips and they get uh, you know a nice envelope or a nice honoraria for giving a twenty minute talk. Uh, or and we extend that even to to, to you know to, to speaking to uh, you know foreign government owned and controlled uh, news outlets. We think we should probably be mm-hmm. on most news outlets, but you know we, we don't want to be in a situation where our where our staff are taking funding from mm-hmm. from foreign governments. Uh, and we make an active effort to we disclose potential conflicts of interest in our research products. And when people write for Responsible Statecraft, our publication, we actually ask them to fill out a conflict of interest disclosure, where we just say basically, is there anything we need to know? Do you take or does your employer take any funding from entities that may have a financial interest in in this work? Doesn't mean we wouldn't publish it. 
we would just say, if it's interesting, just type of a disclosure, we would include that and say, you know, in the interest of full disclosure, here we go. Here, here here's, here's, here's who funds them and we'll, we'll let the work stand for itself. Uh, but th- okay. that's unusual because uh, I've looked at some other think tanks and their conflict of interest disclosures and they go in a very different direction. Their concern in conflict of interest is always out the conflicts between the work that they are doing, that their staff are doing at the think tanks and outside consulting that they might be doing that may damage mm. the think tank. Mm-hmm. Uh, so like, for instance, mm. CNAS, I know, has a conflict of interest disclosure they've pointed me to a number of times. But it doesn't address how funding at the think tank may pose a conflict of interest for the work that's being produced uh, under the think tank. Mm-hmm. Okay, last question. Uh, and I don't know what the answer to this is going to be, which actually has been true of many of these questions, but particularly this one. Uh, I-, I saw yesterday on Twitter, you had done some Twitter thread following the money in the case of some particular person who I think had written some op-ed or something and you found something at the end, and I just didn't have time to read the thread. So maybe this will be like a, a fascinating thriller of a story, and sure. maybe it won't be. I don't <laughs> know. Quick. You tell me. Is this a thriller? <laughs> yeah. Okay. Yeah. Well, sure. Why story? not? Yeah. It, it was. This guy wrote an op-ed for the Hill, uh, uh, Hill dot com about why the Coast Guard uh, should be vital for defending Taiwan against China, uh, advocating for the Coast Guard to be provided to be provided the resources to. Uh, protect Taiwan 6,000 miles from the California from California's coast. Uh, and uh, it, at the bottom it said that one of the uh, one of the authors of this op-ed uh, worked for an energy company. His name was Adam Stahl. Uh, I think he worked in the Trump administration uh, uh, in the Department of Homeland Security. And it, it just said he now works for an energy company. And I said, well that's interesting. So I started Googling around. I found that the energy company was called Avangrid. I'm probably mispronouncing it. Uh, it's a U.S. energy company, uh, and couldn't I don't know anything I've ever heard of this before. And I said, well, what's Avangrid? And you know, I Google a little more, and it turns out, well, okay, it's eighty percent owned by I think it's a Spanish uh, company called uh, Iberdrola, I B E R D R O L A, uh, and that's mm-hmm. interesting. Eighty eighty one and a half percent owned by them. Literally, just this is all in about three or four minutes of googling, and then boom, Iberdrola in September. Uh, put out a press release saying they had expanded in Asia Pacific with the development of a six gigawatt pipeline in Taiwan. Uh, and I think that that's a really good indicator of the, the type of stuff that just flies under the radar in Washington. People don't go looking for it, but also publications like The Hill, I don't think they ask about it. They don't say, hey, is there, do you have any conflicts we should be aware of? Uh, and I don't think that means, again, that he shouldn't write that, that he shouldn't have those opinions, that he shouldn't get to put that argument out there. But that's the type of disclosure that readers should be provided with. Um, and I know, I know it's the third rail. We're talking about money. You're not supposed to do that. Um, but it matters. This guy's employer is owned by his, his, effectively his parent company, is owned by people who have a real financial interest in maintaining good relations with Taipei. And here he is writing for an audience. It's the Hill. You're writing for a DC audience. You're trying to influence mm-hmm. US policy. He's explicit in what he's asking for. Uh, and we should at least have it out in the open who his financial and what financial interests uh, he has and, and how they may benefit from uh, the arguments that he's making. Uh, it's just it's a small example, but I think it's a good one that it's short. It's concise. It's something we can get our heads around. Yeah. And it does seem like kind of an extreme proposal, given the actual mandate of the U.S. Coast Guard. <laughs> That it should it be involves the coast, I think. <laughs> yeah, I think it's about the American coast. I thought that was the idea. But yeah. Uh, OK, so as long as we're on uh, you, Twitter, what's your Twitter handle? Or, Eli Clifton. Uh, Eli Clifton. Ironically enough, Eli Clifton's Twitter handle is Eli Clifton. Mine is Robert Ryder, W-R-I-G-H. T-E-R. Anything else you want to uh, promote? I mean, your, your writing appears often in Responsible Statecraft. It does. It does. Uh, um, which also, I must say, sometimes republishes things that have appeared in my non-zero newsletter. Including which, you. Uh, including <laughs> things written by me, which is a, a, a Funny, property of newsletter. many things in my newsletter. Yes. Uh, not all, not all, uh, but 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 most. Um, so, uh, so, Let, well, so I, thanks. You know, I, I, there, was, there was one thing I want to do before we leave, which yeah. is that, no, I've never, I've never done this publicly, but... Um, you know, I think it is interesting just you know, to, to end this with that you're not supposed to ask about money in foreign policy and in Washington. And 
You know, the first time I understood how strong that sentiment was and what journalists especially face when they are start asking those questions happened yeah. in 2011. And I have this email. I was writing a story about the Foundation for Defense of Democracies because I, I had gotten some of their early donor roles. Uh, and, and I was, you know, looking at who they were and trying to understand why they might have given money. And, and I reached out to Cliff May, who was then the president of FDD. Uh, and he wrote back, pushing back really hard about the fact that I was going to write about his funders. And and he ended it with this, you know, I don't know, you can decide if it's condescending or not. But he said, Eli, you seem like a bright young man. So this unsought advice from an old guy, a former New York Times reporter, foreign correspondent and editor, think hard about whether you're really satisfied being a partisan hack taking cheap shots. If not, you need to change course. Otherwise, I, sus- I suspect you'll wake up one morning a few years from now dissatisfied with yourself. And you'll remember then that I told you so now. Now, I don't take it personally. It's my suspicion that Cliff May has probably written that to a lot of people. I think that that's actually probably commonly the sentiment in Washington when reporters or other people who are interested in the topic start to ask questions about who funds this and what does that mm-hmm. mean? You know, you're met with contempt, you're met with condescension. Um, and I think in any other policy space, we would say that's a legitimate question to ask. And I think we got to normalize the foreign policy space if we're going to you know, actually make some meaningful headway in, the, in, in changing U.S. foreign policy in ways that better serve the U.S. interests. And did his prediction hold up several years later? Were you suffused in self-loathing? Uh, no more so than I was back then. <laughs> okay, so it's pretty much... So the answer is yes, but uh, that did, didn't didn't represent yeah, the trend it, sorry, line. Sorry, Cliff, it, it didn't. I, I wouldn't say that. Yeah, really I was already there, I, man. I, I, I feel better about myself now than I did then. Oh, good. And I feel Excellent. glad that I got to ask these questions. Yeah. Well, keep it up. <laughs> thanks. Uh, thanks so much, Eli. So, so uh, people will be looking for your work at uh, Responsible Statecraft uh, and. What? Quincyinst.org? What is it? Quincy what is the URL for Quincy? Quincyinst.org. I-N-S-T. Quincyinst. Yeah. Okay. All right. Thanks so much for taking the time. Thank you, Bob. This has been fun.